the 19th of March, 1979, Jean Monnet's funeral. Little known to the general public of his own country, Jean Monnet's life and work had a profound influence on the destiny of the world. At each fateful moment of history, the First and Second World Wars, the American involvement against the Nazis, the liberation and rebuilding of France, the Cold War, the integration of Europe, Jean Monnet was there, intent upon his single purpose, to organize peace and union. Jean Monnet was born in 1888 into a family of brandy merchants in Cognac. At the age of 16, his father sent him off to visit clients all over the world and said to him, don't take any books, no one can do your thinking for you. Look out of the window, talk to people. It was in the United States that Jean Monnet became aware of just how big the world was. In 1914, Jean Monnet was 26. The stupidity of war and the carnage all around him spurred him into action. It so happened that I played an important part in World War I. Why? Because it was quite clear to me that France couldn't go it alone, and neither could Britain. So they had to unite their efforts. It's this fundamental idea of union between peoples that's haunted me all my life. He persuaded the French Prime Minister to accept a plan for a joint Franco-British war effort. At critical moments, simple ideas tend to be hard to come by. And so the very simple idea of Britain and France organizing a joint operation was new. In 1917, Jean Monnet set up the pool of Allied shipping to foil the German submarine blockade. More than two million Americans were thus carried over to France and lent all their weight to the final victory. Clemenceau and President Wilson suggested that Jean Monnet should be appointed to the newly created League of Nations. He soon found that joint efforts to rebuild the world on a basis of equality were getting nowhere. The system whereby each and every country retained its full sovereignty, meaning that it could say yes or no without being accountable to anybody, was all right up to a point. But it had serious drawbacks. The flaw was in the Treaty of Versailles, which maintained inequality of treatment between peoples. Europe had hardly finished picking up the pieces after the war before fascism and Nazism were on the march, and once again, Jean Monnet set about defending freedom. The vital thing for him was to secure mastery of the air. He won over the French Prime Minister and the Supreme Allied Council, who told him to order aero engines from the United States. These arrived too late to prevent the invasion of France, but did help the Royal Air Force win the Battle of Britain over London. The war was about to take a different turn. With France in disarray, Jean Monnet persuaded Churchill and de Gaulle to make a very bold proposal to the French government, to unite under a single flag, a single parliament, a single nation. But it was too late. Pétain had just accepted defeat. For Jean Monnet, only American support could enable France and Europe to regain their freedom. He decided to act in Washington. Churchill appointed him to the British Supply Council, although he was a Frenchman. I was convinced that the Americans had a huge production machine, but it wasn't fully geared to the war effort. We worked out with their military what would be produced in 42 and 43. It was nowhere near enough. He persuaded Roosevelt to quadruple output and coined the famous phrase, America will become the arsenal of democracy. Jean Monnet played a decisive role in this gigantic armaments program, which according to the economist Keynes, probably shortened the war by a year. Following the liberation of North Africa, Jean Monnet became a member of the Free French government. He left for Washington to negotiate the purchase of military equipment to arm the Free French. Thanks to him, the armies of General Leclerc and General Delattre had the equipment they needed to take part in the liberation of France. Nineteen forty-five, peace was restored. 
Jean Monnet's sole concern was to breathe new life and vigour into his country. He proposed a plan for rebuilding France to de Gaulle. The general asked him to implement it. La France est maintenant à la croisée des chemins. France is now at a crossroads. If she embarks purposefully on a modernization program, she can very quickly increase her production capacity and her productivity. The motto of the plan was modernize or decline. By getting all the parties concerned seated around a table to define the general interest and even persuading the secretary general of the CGT, the most radical union, to accept longer working hours, Jean Monnet got the French economy off the ground. Once again, the clouds of war were gathering over the world. The Cold War broke out between East and West. America offered Europe the Marshall Plan. Russia lowered the Iron Curtain. Jean Monnet then struck a blow for peace. He pledged the nations of the old continent to union and persuaded them to take the first step towards the United States of Europe. His first proposal was to create a coal and steel pool by placing French and German coal and steel production under a joint high authority, open to the other countries of Europe. Three days later, Mr. Schumann telephoned me to say that he agreed. He'd seen beyond coal and steel and understood that they were simply a means to an end, a way of fostering an altogether new relationship between France and Germany and putting an end to a feud which had turned Europe into a bloodbath. To discuss and agree is one thing, to compel recognition is another. I was therefore convinced that we could not establish peace in Europe without establishing equality and eliminating domination wherever possible. The plan was enthusiastically welcomed by Chancellor Adenauer. Robert Schumann made the proposal public. Eleven months later, six countries signed the treaty. The high authority, chaired by Jean Monnet, took up office. And a common market in coal and steel became a reality. From this morning, the 1st of May, all of us, Germans, Belgians, French, Dutch, Italians and Luxembourgers are on the way to becoming Europeans. There'll no longer be German coal or French steel, but European coal and European steel, moving between us as in a single country with 155 million consumers, as many as in the United States or the Soviet Union. Our coal and steel community is a living reality. It's a first step towards a united Europe. Rejection of the European defence community by the French National Assembly on the 30th of August 1954 halted progress towards a united Europe. But nothing daunted, Jean Monnet formed the Action Committee for the United States of Europe. This committee was inspired by a simple idea, to get the majority of European parties and trade unions together around the same table. Its purpose was to keep the idea that Europe is essential, alive among the politicians, some of them powerful men in their own countries. The idea gained ground. Messina, then Rome, where on the 25th of March 1957, the European Economic Community and Euratom treaties were signed. Jean Monnet's children, as Paul-Henri Spack called them. And finally, on the 22nd of January 1972, came the long-awaited entry of the United Kingdom into the community. The full impact of this event has yet to be gauged. It will have far-reaching repercussions. To those to whom the success of his endeavours remained a mystery, Jean Monnet replied, There's no mystery about it. There's a lot of toil and a lot of trouble, I can tell you that. But our discussions focus on one issue, Europe, that is to say, the common interest. At the beginning of 1975, Jean Monnet retired to his home at Oujarret in Les Yvelines, not far from Paris, to write his memoirs. Meanwhile, he'd had the satisfaction of seeing his policy pursued by Schmidt, Giscard d'Estaing, Wilson, and many others with the adoption of universal suffrage for the election of the European Parliament and the creation of the European Council of Heads of State and Government. Looking back over the long road he'd traveled, he said, 
It was always second nature to me to try to convince those who were willing to listen of the need to unite Europe in the interest of each and every one of us. This is only the beginning of what needs to be done in Europe if we are to achieve lasting unity, prosperity and peace. Thank you.